Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome American poet and activist Javier Zamora. How's everybody doing? Good? Good. That was a great panel. Woo! We were tearing up backstage. Um, I just want to say that it's a huge honor to be here, and I just want to thank everybody who's making this conference happen. The drivers, um, everybody running around, getting everybody water. Um, thank you. And now I'll read two poems, and this first poem is to my grandma, who I couldn't see for 19 years, and she raised me and I couldn't see her because of my immigration status. To Abuelita Nelly, this is my 19th time pressing roses in fake passports for each year I haven't climbed Marañón trees. I'm sorry I've lied about where I was born. Today, this country chose its first black president. Maybe he changes things. I've told mom I don't want to have to choose to get married. You understand. Abuelita, I can't go back and return. There's no path to papers. I've got nothing left but dreams where I am, the parakeet nest on the Flor de Fuego, the paper boats we made when streets flooded, or toys I buried by the foxtail ferns. Do you know the ferns I mean? The ones we planted the first birthday without my parents. I'll never be a citizen. I'll never scrub clothes with pumice stones over the big cement tub under the almond trees. Last time you called, you said, my old friends think that now I'm from some town between this bay and our estero, and that I'm a coconut, brown on the outside, white inside. Abuelita, please forgive me, but tell them they don't know shit. <laughs> And I crossed through the Sonoran Desert when I was nine years old. And this is a story about a Border Patrol agent who could see the humanity. Let me try again. I could bore you with the sunset, the way water tasted after so many days without it the trees, the breed of dogs, but I can't say there were 40 people when we found the ranch with the thin white man, his dogs, and his shotgun. Until this 5 a.m., I couldn't remember there were only five or seven people. We had separated by the Palo Verdes. We meaning four people, not 40. The rest, I don't know. They weren't there when the thin white men let us drink from a hose while pointing his shotgun. In pocho Spanish, he told us, si correr perros at the car. If run, dogs, trained, attack. When La Migra arrived, an officer who probably called himself Hispanic at best, not Mexicano like we called him said, Buenas noches, and gave us pan dulce y chocolate. Procedure says he should have taken us back to the station, checked our fingerprints, etc. He must have remembered his family over the border or the border coming over them because he drove us to the border and told us, next time, rest at least five days. Don't trust anyone calling themselves coyotes. Bring more tortillas, sardines, alhambra. He knew we would try again and again, like everyone does. Mm. Thank you.
must also lift by legislation the bars of discrimination against those who seek entry into our country, particularly those with much needed skills and those joining their families. In establishing preferences, a nation that was built by the immigrants of all lands can ask those who now seek admission, what can you do for our country? But we should not be asking, in what country were you born? Please welcome the President and General Counsel of MALDEF, Thomas Sines, Professor of Public Policy Practice at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, Ruth Wassum, award-winning Salvadorian-American poet and activist, Javier Zamora, and Director of Civic Engagement and Lecturer at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, Victoria De Francesco Soto. Welcome. Thank you for being with us here today to talk about immigration. Immigration is what created this nation. From the pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock, to the forced migration of African slaves, to the waves upon waves of immigrants who came to this country. With few exceptions, we are all immigrants. But nevertheless, the issue of immigration divides us. It's, it's like we have a love-hate relationship with immigration. Take the example of the 1880s, when we have Emma Lazarus write her great Colossus poem, where she writes, bring me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. During the time she was writing that poem, the first Chinese Exclusion Act was put into practice. Fast forward to 1965, when President LBJ signed the Immigration and Nationality Act that reopened our golden gates and did away with the restrictive policies of the late 1800s and early 1990s. Today, the pendulum has swung to where just a couple of days ago, our president said that we're full, that we can't take any more people, and that you have to go back. At this moment, immigration is probably one of the most dominant political issues that we face. Less than 300 miles south of us, we are seeing a crisis unfold before our eyes. Depending on what side of the aisle you're on, that could be a crisis of security or it could be a humanitarian crisis. But the crisis is real and we're seeing the images, the faces of these people. However, no matter how much we read the stories, or how much we watch the news, or actually even go down to the borders I have myself for my research or to cover immigration, we can't begin to understand these experiences of what drives people to immigrate and immigrate crossing these treacherous paths. So I wanted to start this conversation with, with you, Javier. It, you, you made this, this journey as a nine-year-old child, leaving La Radura, El Salvador, coming through Mexico, in crossing the, the US-Mexico border. Help us understand what the pull and push factors are. What was so strong, what was so strong that pushed you, your family, and pushes thousands of others to leave everything you've known, everything you love, and risk your life to come here? Well, I'll begin with the Civil War and so that happened in the 80s. My parents grew up during that time. And that was surprisingly a less violent time than my country is facing now. So my dad came in 1991 because of his political background. Um, he was the head of a fishing co-op, and we grew up in a fishing village. And so he was a leftist, and he wasn't allowed. And so he had to flee. And then my mom came in 1994. By then, it was peace, but poverty was still, nothing had changed much. So there's violence, there's poverty, and then the violence started back again, and corruption. As uh, we see in the headlines now, corruption is a huge problem in these three countries, and nobody is really addressing that. So it's still 
um, in my hometown now is actually more violent than it was during the war. Now we can't, what my grandparents tell me is like, now at least back then we could see the uniform and we could see who it was. Mm -hmm. Now you don't know who it is and we don't know who it is that's gonna come to your home and potentially kill you. That's a scary environment and I think that's what people are fleeing. And um, so as of last year, El Salvador had the highest murder rate in the whole world, followed uh, by Honduras and Nicaragua. So understanding the, the violence and piece. Guatemala. The, and They're, Guatemala. All three yeah. switch, like every year, one time, one year is El Salvador, another year is Honduras. And, and we're also not talking about the huge femicide rates in these three countries as well. So Ruth, I want to talk to you about the experience of um, the folks who are here come either undocumented, living in the shadows, and a, a popular um, refrain is, get in line. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just get in line like everybody else? I'm not necessarily against immigration, per se, but I don't like line cutters. Mm -hmm. Explain to us. I mean, you are one of the foremost experts on the intricacies of congressional research when it comes to immigration. So walk us through that line. Well. It's very difficult to qualify for an immigration visa to the United States. The only category of people who can come in without limitations are the immediate relatives of US citizens. And by immediate relatives, I mean the spouse, minor children, or if you, as the US citizen, are over 21, your parents. After that, there are categories of other family that may be eligible under a numerically limited, very uh, uh, limited categories of uh, other uh, adult uh, married children and unmarried children and brothers and sisters, and the immediate relatives of people who are legal permanent residents in the United States. We also have about 140,000 visas set aside every year for employment-based or economic migrants. And um, those are also very hard to obtain, uh, it, especially if you're not an extraordinary or, or exceptional person. And trust me, um, even though I can't see you in the bright lights, I would guess that few of you would meet that category. I like to think of myself, those of us up here as extraordinary, but it's a very high threshold. Otherwise, you have to be someone who is uh, an employer can uh, go through a, a, a process that shows there aren't qualified U.S. workers that could fill that job. Um, that's the other category for professional and, and skilled uh, workers coming in. So we admit about a million people a year. Um, uh, half of those are the immediate relatives of U.S. citizens, the unlimited category. And um, in addition to that, there are at any one time a pool of about four million people who have already qualified for one of those visas under these very narrow criteria. Um, so if you, uh, I always say immigration to the United States is who you know. It's who, uh, who you're married to, your family, or who will hire you. Uh, it's a very hard uh, way uh, to get into the country. So in a sense, if you do not have an immediate family member, there's really not much of a line there. There, are, Yes, we do have a diversity uh, lottery, and uh, that is uh, about 50,000 uh, visas a year that are, is based on a formula uh, for underrepresented countries. And in the early years, it was created in 1990, it was largely people from Eastern Europe and Ireland. There was a special set aside for Ireland. Now it's largely people from African nations in the Middle East that come in. But that's the only independent category. And even there, you have to have um, uh, uh, you know, educational equivalencies and skills and, and go through extensive background checks. So moving from, from the topic of, of lines to maybe alternate paths, Tom, uh, in 2012, we know that President Obama offered an executive memo on DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, to provide some sort of protection for immigrant youth who had arrived in this country and had played by the rules. So this provided protection and work permits as well. President Trump comes into office, and within the first couple of months, he rescinds DACA. Uh, however, it, it is still in place and largely because of your efforts, efforts of MALDEF and other civil rights organizations. So, Tom, if you could talk us through where we are in terms of the courts and the court battle to preserve DACA 
and where we're going, where you see DACA ultimately ending up? Well, I think DACA still exists because of the power of the initiative that was put in place by President Obama and specifically because of the power of the students, the DACA recipients, who have contributed so much and continue to contribute so much to our country. So I think despite the fact that it's in the court's hands, this is largely in place because of the political demand that the people have made that it remain in place. As you know, it was an initiative designed to exercise prosecutorial discretion. And that's something that every president since we've been enforcing immigration laws in a serious way, has had to engage. So there are precedents for DACA uh, under presidents from both parties where the exercise of prosecutorial discretion basically said, we are not going to target this particular population of undocumented folks, and we're going to permit them to remain, we know where they are, uh, without necessarily an extended promise, but a promise for today that they would not be removed. And in the meantime, they have the opportunity to work through work authorization. So the issue is in the courts, however, because Donald Trump had Jeff Sessions go out and announce that he could not keep the program in place because of legal compulsion. That was the reason that was offered, that he didn't have the power as president to provide deferred action to so many individuals. That was actually untrue. As I said, there are precedents under precedent, presidents from both parties, certainly exercising prosecutorial discretion in a modern age with so many people involved in a system requires something like DACA, mm -hmm. where you can centrally administer it. Beyond that, I think it's ironic that today, the same president who had his attorney general announce that he was unable legally to keep in place an exercise of presidential discretion, now asserts through an emergency declaration the right to divert billions of dollars away from previously allocated programs to create an unnecessary wall. But you said we were moving away from line cutters, and I think that's not quite true. <laughs> I hate the term, and indeed I hate when politicians of either party come out and say, I want to address this issue, but people should wait in line. What's important to note, particularly at a summit on race, is there is not one line. There are multiple lines for each of the categories that you heard described of potential immigrants. But beyond that, there's an over, overriding set of lines based on what country you come from. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that the 1965 Immigration Act was correctly characterized by President Johnson as civil rights legislation because it eliminated the bias in favor of Northern and Western Europe uh, for immigration and made possible for the first time, immigration from Asia in significant numbers, from which our country has undoubtedly benefited extremely. Nonetheless, we still have a system where we assume that the demand to immigrate from every country in the world is equal. So we set the same quota, equal quotas, for every country in the world, which means that where there's a higher demand to immigrate, whether because of proximity or historical connection, or cultural connection, uh, where there is a higher demand to immigrate, you're gonna wait longer, in a longer line from that country. And everyone here can go to the State Department website and you can subscribe to the monthly visa bulletin and it will tell you what those lines are. What it means is saying that they should get in line does not reflect reality. For example, Mexico, which has the longest lines, someone in the same category as someone from another country will wait 14 years after being fully qualified for a visa to become available, compared to someone in the same category from another country who will wait two to four years. And so the question I would like the political leaders to pose when they talk about the line and folks waiting in line is what would you do if you had to wait 14 years to reunite with your family, but you knew that others were only waiting two to four years for the same opportunity to reunite with your family. Would you wait? Or would you cross the border? Or would you take a tourist visa and overstay that visa to remain united with your family? And if we start to understand the racialized nature, continued racialized nature of our immigration system, I think we understand why many of the DACA students are here because they are caught in a system that is racialized today. <laughs> and 
and many others, I have to say, are, are caught in a system that fails to recognize, perhaps more than any other immigrant receiving nation in the world, that immigration is not solely a domestic issue. That it is an issue that is international and at least binational in each and every instance where there is an immigration issue. But we fail to recognize that in this country. We treat immigration as though our only concern is what's happening here in the United States. So for example, we know, but it doesn't get talked about, that many of the refugees, so many of the refugees who are seeking to enter this country from the Northern Triangle are fleeing conditions that at least in part were created by the United States' own deportation policies in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, we didn't care about what happened once we deported people, what happened to their communities. We now know what happened, and it's creating a humanitarian crisis and refugees seeking to come to this country and be freed from those terrible conditions, but they were in part created by our country treating immigration as solely a domestic issue. So in my, in my first day of class when I teach my immigration seminar here at the LBJ School, I say to my students, if there's anything you take away from this class, take home the idea of push-pull factors. When we're talking about immigration, it takes two to tango. There's the push factors from your country, but also the pull factors, the direct and indirect pull factors. In the case of the United States, the opportunity, the employment, but when we're talking about Central America, the violence that was perpetrated for foreign policy. So if you take anything away from this panel, it's looking at immigration within the scope of push and pull. And, and immigration is something that is not static. It's not, you know, the 1965 reform was massive, was incredible, but it's time that we have a new one, right? Because immigrants themselves have changed. The push-pull factors have changed. And Ruth, you, you recently wrote in The Hill, where you're a contributor, that uh, the future of immigration is quite different than what we normally talk about in the media. Uh, we tend to think of Mexicans, or at the very least, Latin Americans, and low-skilled laborers, your nannies, your gardeners, or whatnot, that lower skill. But you, uh, you write that it's actually something very different that is happening right now and what we will see in the future. Yes, uh, it's interesting because Vicki is uh, exactly right in, in terms of the, the public perception of where immigrants are coming from. Um, immigrants, immigration from Mexico has actually declined um, over the last decade. Um, and uh, the fertility rate in Mexico has gone down. And mm -hmm. so it's likely that um, the um, number of visas uh, that Mexicans will be seeking to the come, come to the United States uh, may indeed be diminishing, even though there's a lot of people already waiting uh, for um, their, uh, their visa. Uh, Asia is where most of the immigrants are coming from now. Uh, in the, uh, since 2010, uh, the number of immigrants from Asia is about uh, 2.6 million, as opposed to Latin America, where it was 1.2 million. So it's, it's more than double in terms of uh, the sending region of the world for migrants to the United States. Uh, this uh, does show up in uh, changing uh, workforce. It also is something that was driven in part by uh, the various pathways uh, to come to the United States. And we've talked about uh, people that are, are, are being pushed here, fleeing uh, desperate situations. But there are also um, people coming here for the, 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 the draw, the pull of, uh, of uh, education and high-skilled work and uh, the engine of the U.S. economy. Foreign, there was a pathway of, of people uh, becoming foreign students at world-class universities like the University of Texas. Uh, they then, uh, after graduation, get work permits or temporary worker visas, and they're part of a very long line of people waiting for one of those employment-based visas that we've talked about. Um, a couple of things uh, are in the mix right now when we think about this. One, I uh, recently read that uh, new enrollments of foreign students is down 6.5% um, uh, 
uh, in the last two years. Uh, and, uh, and that in Canada, they're having an uptick, that there, things are, the preference of where is the most desirable place uh, for the best and the brightest to go may not always be the United States of America. And, and, and we should be concerned about that. Um, there's also a um, pressures on, on the high-skilled immigration, and this is where you see the most activity in terms of people wanting to, to make change. Uh, to legislate, in addition to broad support for legislation to adjust the status of, of the DACA recipients, the DREAMers, um, there's also a lot of support for expanding um, visas for people with what we call STEM degrees, people that are studying in the sciences, technology, uh, engineering, and math, because those are areas where there always seems to be uh, uh, demand for, for more work. And this is largely where a lot of the Asians and Africans are coming um, uh, in through the high skilled. And, and that's what we're seeing in terms of the immigrant flow tends to be pretty uh, kind of bifurcated with very, very high skilled people coming in. Uh, and then uh, because it's hard to compete uh, for jobs at the middle range, there is also a demand for low skilled workers or what is kind of colloquially said as the jobs U.S. workers won't do. Ruth, let me ask you this. So we're at record low unemployment rates. Uh, what do you think about moving from our family reunification model of immigration to one like that in Canada or New Zealand or Australia that is merit-based, that looks to fill these jobs either at the high end or low end and leave, leave behind the family reunification? What, what do you say to that? Well, I don't have to go too far to the statue of Barbara Jordan. And she, in one of her last uh, formal duties for, as a public servant, chaired the commission, the congressionally mandated commission on immigration reform in the mid-1990s. And she, as, you know, she was representing a diverse group of people on this commission, but as the spokesperson for the commission, she said that some of the family categories should be cut back. That was one of the recommendations, that uh, brothers and sisters and, and, and some of those, and, and thinking more, in, the, in their case, uh, they were also thinking about refugee admissions and making sure, that, which is another big concern, which we haven't touched on, and I'll, yes, I'll set that will. aside. No, yeah. I figure we will. We will. Um, but uh, employment-based, so long as there are uh, adequate and efficacious labor market protections for U.S. workers, um, the oh, and for foreign workers, for that matter, when you're bringing workers in, um, Arguably, this isn't an immigration issue, it's a labor enforcement issue. It's wage and hour, it's working conditions. Mm -hmm. And if those laws are in place, whether an employer is hiring a worker from abroad or from around the corner shouldn't matter. And particularly in the, the current economy, um, it, it's not, uh, you know, it, we clearly um, are experiencing a, gr a need for workers. And so uh, there is pressure. Um, I think that that's one of the areas uh, uh, legislatively where we're going to see action. But uh, it's, a, it's a heavy lift, and uh, I'm not sure we've got the strength for it right now. So, Javier, we, we've got the, the legislative uh, sphere here where we're talking about visas and DACA and whatnot. But uh, we're also talking about the wall. And I wanted uh, to read an excerpt from one of your poems in Unaccompanied. You have a poem entitled To President-Elect. Your anthology was published in 2017, so President Trump had, had yet to take office. You write, there's no fence. There's a tunnel. There's a hole in the wall. Yes, you think right now, no one's running. If the fences don't work, then what is the alternative to a wall? And I'd like all of us here to, to weigh in on this. I like that we're talking about this idea of lines. You know, so I, I did get an EB-1 visa, also known as an Einstein visa. Yeah. I'd like to throw that in. Like, <laughs> He's the only one in the room that would qualify for us. So, uh, so this, this idea of having to be extraordinary is ridiculous. And even, even, so I was in this country for 19 years without being able to go back. And I was treated like I had never been here. So I had to go back to El Salvador for two months and not knowing whether I was gonna pass the interview. So I had to like self-deport back this past summer. And I think 
and then just going and experiencing the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador, which is full all the time, and just seeing the massive lines every day and people begin to cry, the ones who can afford to have that one meeting uh, to see whether they can come here, which costs around $800 in a country where the daily wage is like $25 max, like tops. That's if you have like a really good job. So that's a problem. I think we need to address uh, more, we need to weigh more staff around U.S. embassies around the world, and we need to actually make it cheaper for people to apply for those visas, and just, people don't want to come here and stay. You know, why would somebody leave the home and the people and everybody that they know? They just want to come here and work and have enough money and then go back. That is every immigrant's dream. And then you come here and then you realize that you can't go back, so you stay. So there's, there's something that needs to be fixed outside and not thinking about a wall because that's just wasted money. People are still going to come. You know? The wall. The, we were talking about this earlier with the Emergency Act, the funding for the wall. Tom, what's the alternative? Well, first of all, we, we, we don't need a wall. And I think we should recognize, again... We should recognize, again, the fundamentally racialized and racist notion of a lot of what we're talking about. We're not talking about a wall on our northern border, or even a moat, or even a little ditch. And I'll tell you what, a wall is as much needed on the northern border as it is, as it is in the southern border, which is to say it's not needed at all. But we don't talk about an unneeded wall on the northern border, we only talk about an unneeded wall on the southern border. And that is a racialized discussion of border security, and we need to recognize that fundamental fact. We also need to recognize, in my view, that a lot of the ways that family-based immigration, and we've had a system that is both employment, labor-based, and family-based for a long time, and the family-based aspects of that have served us very, very well, not just from the standpoint of humanitarian perspective, but from the economic perspective, because families, including extended families, are very efficacious economic units in our economy. And they have proven that over generations and generations. But when we hear conversation about anchor babies and chain migration, these are fundamentally racialized and racist language to use in discussing these issues. And we need to recognize that. Those terms are used because they are a veiled way of indicating that the individual is talking about immigration by people of color. There's no way of getting around that. You also talked about the stereotypes about all immigrants being Latino. A stereotype, I think, more specifically, is that all undocumented immigrants are Latino. And that then permits the government regularly, over years and years, not just under the Trump administration, to engage in disparate enforcement that has a decidedly racial element to it. Five or six years ago, Maldef, together with others, took the publicly available data from the federal government and showed that over 90% of deportation removals were of immigrants from Latin countries. I say that, and nobody is gasping or shocked because we assume that's roughly commensurate with the proportion of removable immigrants who are Latino. It's not. It's not even close. There's at least a 20% gap in that number. Imagine if we had that kind of a gap in another form of law enforcement. We would recognize that that's an issue of racial discrimination and concern for civil rights. But that pattern of extremely high proportions of removals from the Latino community is not talked about as we go about discussing these important immigration issues. So, so much of our discussion today is racialized, including the discussion of the wall. But the truth is we need an approach to immigration that recognizes those who have been here and contributing, talk about a full employment economy, in a full employment economy, I have yet to find an economist who would say it makes sense at that point to remove a million workers from the labor force. And yet, by attempting to eliminate DACA 
and attempting to eliminate TPS or temporary protected status for immigrants who have been here in some case for over 10 years, those two classes alone are a million workers. So while he touts the full employment economy, he talks about removing a million workers from the labor force immediately. Why? Because he knows or believes his base will know that the vast, vast majority of TPS holders and DACA holders are people of color. So the solution is not the wall. We don't need a wall. We need a more sophisticated approach to immigration that recognizes it is both an international and a domestic issue, and that looks to invest, not cut off aid, but to invest in the countries that we want to bolster to reduce the push factors. Instead, we're going the other direction. And, and finally, we need an immigration system that doesn't rely on a technicality in our Constitution to avoid the kinds of constitutional principles that we accept as a matter of course everywhere else. That includes, for example, discrimination in the national origin quotas that I talked about. Imagine if what I described was a university and we told Mexican Americans, you're gonna wait 14 years to get your slot in this university. Everyone else can wait two to four, you're gonna wait 14 years. We wouldn't accept it. That's part of the reason that people don't understand that we still have race in our immigration system because they can't fathom that in 2019 that could kill it, still occur. It does because immigration is an exception to equal protection because we're talking about folks who are not yet in the United States. But what we need is an immigration system that thoroughly reflects our constitutional values and principles as a people. And, and Thank you, Tom. And, and if I could add on and rather underline the foreign policy component to it. So just recently, President Trump or his administration said that they would not be providing aid to Central American countries because they were sending so many migrants, whereas that is the one thing that could help stem the push. And, and I think the idea here is that foreign aid is a gimme. Foreign aid is a strategic part of our foreign policy. So I think when we think about immigration, it's not just a domestic issue, it's a global issue. Uh, Ruth, let me get back to the wall. The what wall. is the alternative to the well, wall? I see the wall as a symbol of failure. I see it as a symbol, you know, the idea that we would build a wall is a failure of, of our foreign policy of not being good neighbors and supportive and nurturing of the other countries in our hemisphere uh, in, in terms of the problems they're having. Um, and, that arguably we have uh, participated in creating. I see it as a symbol of, of, of failure of following our own laws in the statute for how we're supposed to handle refugees and asylum seekers. The law is very clear on this. And Tom could probably be more articulate about it than I am, but individuals who are seeking asylum here deserve a, a hearing. And there are procedures in place that even the border agents are supposed to allow someone to get a credible fear hearing, even when they arrive without documents. This is the law of the United States of America, and we are not following it right now. That's deeply disturbing. A wall, again, symbolizes that failure. And finally, and, and this is going to sound re repetitive, but the wall would symbolize a failure of enacting comprehensive immigration reform. We've all talked about the acceptance, the consensus that our current immigration system doesn't work. It doesn't work for Americans and American business interests. It doesn't work for prospective immigrants. It's keeping families separated. It's keeping employers without adequate uh, uh, labor. Um, and now even our world-class universities are, are in question uh, in terms of enrollments. Uh, I could go on and on. So to me, um, it would be a very, very sad moment if, if that wall was constructed. And uh, those of us who follow immigration, we see the popular refrain saying, take the 25 billion that you're gonna use for the wall, 
put it toward, toward aid, toward these countries, toward a Marshall Plan. And really, this is one of the ideas that we've been seeing is what we did for Europe after World War II to rebuild these countries. Let's do the same for Central America. Uh, we're starting to wind down on time, but I wanted to, to pull back and, and look at the big idea of today in 2019, what it means to be American, what it means to be American in this country of immigrants in the midst of this polemical debate of immigration. So, Javier, if I could start with you asking you what it means. Well, Jose Antonio was supposed to be on, uh, on this panel as well, and, and he has this amazing campaign, like, define American. Yeah. You ask anybody, like, you think about it, how would you define being American? And he has this video about it, and the point is that you can't. Like, well, what, what does it mean? Like, is it where you're from? Like, uh, is it just being an immigrant? Like, people don't know how to define what it is that we are talking about. And I think that's a huge problem. And essentially, for me, being American is just being an immigrant. Mm -hmm. And just having, and being able to dream of a better world in this government and government after government, we forget those two things. Being American is just being a dreamer and being to, and wanting to have and build something that the world has never seen. That, that would be like the closest thing that, it, that comes up to it. Javier, do you feel that um, you've reached the American dream? No, I don't think it exists. You don't think it exists? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pessimist and I am here because I didn't want to be here. I was forced by US policy. My family was forced to come here, so we didn't want to be here. So we're just making, the best with what we have, but I do recognize that, and I always think about this too, what would have happened to me had I stayed in El Salvador? And I certainly wouldn't be up on a panel speaking to people. I probably certainly would not be a poet. And so I am grateful for the opportunities, and this is a, a country where, you, you know, I grew up in during wartime, and that, and that could happen. I could be here only perhaps in this country, but not in El Salvador. So I'm grateful, but I don't think that the American dream exists, and I think that that rhetoric is also problematic, and also I don't have to prove to you that I'm extraordinary in order to be looked at as a human being. And that is, um, and, I, and that, is, that is also my problem with how the dreamer movement which I used to be a part of, uh, has also sold itself. Like, why do we have to be valedictorians, you know, top of our class, in order to be looked at and be given legality? I think that's a problem. And it's because we're forgetting what it means to be American, which is... An immigrant. Yeah, an immigrant. Yeah. Ruth, what does it mean for you? I, I think being an American is always being... It's, it's a dynamic concept. Mm -hmm. uh, it's elusive. Um, and it's always refreshing. You know, when they say you hit that refresh button on your screen. Well, we're always refreshing. And that's why immigration is, is the core of being an American. Um, it, there is an optimism, I think. Um, and, a, uh, and I think that most Americans, despite the rhetoric we're hearing from our government uh, at this particular point in time, most Americans are welcoming of the stranger. Uh, if you look at public opinion data, you see that. Um, if you look at individual acts of generosity, you see that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still reflecting on what Secretary Albright said last night uh, in her remarks. And so I think of us as ever-changing and always, uh, always improving. Um, but um, we need to be asking this question and talking about it a lot more uh, about what it means to be an American. Thank you. Tom. So to be an American and to be, as we all say, in a nation of immigrants means recognizing that that is not only a historical description. It is a forward-looking responsibility to be a nation of immigrants. And that means recognizing that as our country continues to change and evolve, in part through immigration, that there will arise demographic fears in the back of the minds of some folks. 
that their country is changing so rapidly that they won't recognize it. And being a nation of immigrant means anticipating that and working to ensure that that demographic fear is addressed responsibly, not exploited politically, as we currently see nationwide and I've seen recurrently state by state in the past. And it means recognizing that it is our responsibility to have immigration policies today and in the future that reflect that we are a nation of immigrants that believes in justice for all. And that means that we have to adopt a system. I would love for us to have a humane immigration system. We're not there yet, we're not even close. I'd just like us to have a just immigration system that takes out the race, that takes out the nativism, that takes out the lack of due process that somehow recognizes non-citizens as less than citizens when it comes to basic human rights. Taking that out of our system and fostering a notion of a nation of immigrants that looks toward the future in a responsible way is in my mind what it means to be American. The professor and me can't end a, a panel or a talk without giving out homework. So my homework to, to all of you is to also reflect on what it means to be American in, in 2019, especially in the context of what we have been hearing over the past three days, the stories we have heard, the information we have gathered. What does that mean to you? And with that homework assignment, I want to finish up and thank our distinguished panel Thank you so much. Thank you.